And good evening. <laughs> My name's Darren. For those of you who don't know me, I'm on the team here. It's really good to see you all here this evening. And uh, on Marathon Sunday, when the whole of London just seems to be all kind of like upbeat and kind of really positive and celebrating, you know, just effort and energy. And there's a real kind of honour culture and a real culture of encouragement, which is just like fantastic. So uh, this evening we are continuing in our series on Paul's prayers, uh, on your knees, and we are, yeah, going to be looking a little bit at prayer. A couple of years ago, a Christian charity called Tear Fund, that many of you will know, did some research into prayer. And they discovered that in this amazing city, about 73% of people pray at some point. That's an amazing number. I was completely blown out of the water by that. 73%. That means there's a lot more praying than we might imagine. And what are the sorts of things that people are praying for? Well, 68% of people who were praying said that they pray for their family and friends. 41% of people who pray say that they thank God for stuff. 32% of people who pray say that they ask for guidance. And of all those people who pray, roughly 80% say that praying makes them feel better. And about half of them, 50%, say that they believe that their prayer changes the world. So there's more prayer going on in London than we might have imagined. In fact, 12% of people in that survey said that they were atheists and they had no religion. And 12% of that group said that they pray sometimes. So even atheists are praying. Even people who have no religion are praying. They may not know who they're praying to. They may not know what they're praying for. They may not know what effect their prayers are having, but they're praying. And so this evening we're continuing with our series, On Your Knees, looking at the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And we're looking at Paul's prayers because Paul is an expert in prayer. Paul is an expert in prayer. And so we're looking at Paul's prayers, expecting to learn. We're expecting to learn something about prayer. And we're going to be looking tonight at that passage that Sarah just read from 1 Thessalonians. You might want to keep that open. It's on page 1122 of the Church Bibles. And we're going to be looking at that, but let's ask for God's help first. Let's pray together first. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who speaks to us. We thank you that you speak to us through your servants, the prophets and the apostles. And we thank you that in these latter days you've spoken to us through your son. And Lord, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us this evening. That Lord, as we bring our lives and our hearts before you, as we hold them out to you, that you would take hold of what we bring. And you would take hold of what we're not bringing. You would take hold of everything and that you would transform us by your word this evening. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're looking at Paul's prayer in 1 Thessalonians. We're expecting to learn something about prayer because Paul's prayer has lots to tell us about prayer. Paul's prayers have lots to tell us about how to pray. First of all, they tell us why we might pray. They tell us why we might pray. We look at Paul's prayers, we see why we might pray. We look at Paul's prayers, we see how we might pray. We see how we might pray. And we look at Paul's prayer in that passage and we see what happens when we pray. What happens when we pray. So three things, why we pray, how we pray, what happens when we pray, and we're going to work through those uh, this evening. So why do we pray? We pray because God is sovereign. God is sovereign. It's right there at the beginning of the Bible. God commands the universe to come into existence, and it obeys him. 
God commands planet Earth to come into existence and it obeys him. God commands the sun and the moon and the stars to shine in the sky and they obey him. God commands the mountains to be lifted up and the seas to stay in their place and they obey him. He commands the trees and the grass in the field to bear fruit and seed and they obey him. He commands the animals to multiply according to their kind and they obey him and he creates us and even when we're disobedient, he comes after us. He proclaims the gospel and he says that he will make everything good so that ultimately we will obey him and at the end every knee will bow at the name of Jesus who is God's anointed king and God will be sovereign over everything God is sovereign he rules over the whole universe this is the God who rules over the universe and this God has done something amazing this God has done something amazing this God has given us permission to speak to him this God has given us permission to just step into his presence almost completely unannounced and just speak to him directly we've received this amazing privilege we can speak to the God who rules the universe. And we can ask him for anything. We can ask him for anything. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing that's outside his power. There's nothing we're going to bring to him or ask him for which is outside what he can cope with. We can ask him for anything. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does in the passage that we're looking at this evening. That's exactly what Paul does. He just asks God for everything that he needs. So he starts off verse 11. He says, May our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. He's asking God to sort out his travel plans. He's asking God to make it possible for him to get to see his friends in the church in Thessalonica. Because he knows that God is sovereign even over the practicalities of a journey. He knows that God has ultimate control over the practical details of his life. He knows that God has ultimate power over the business of his life, over all of the practical stuff that he needs to do. God is sovereign. So he asks God when he needs something. And he doesn't just ask for practical stuff. He's not just got a list of stuff that he needs sorting. He asks God about relationships as well. Verse 12, he says to the Christians in Thessalonica, he says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. So Paul asks God to increase the love of the church. He asks God to make the love of the church overflow because he knows that God is sovereign over relationships. He's sovereign over what goes on between us. He's sovereign over what goes on between you and me. Way back when I was a new Christian, this bloke in church invited me to his home with a bunch of other guys and we prayed together and we encouraged each other and we read the Bible together and we talked about stuff that I'd never talked about before. We talked about, you know, how to spend your money well when you were a Christian, how to avoid porn when you were a Christian, how to date well when you were a Christian. All really, really helpful stuff. And at the time, I have to say, I thought this bloke was bonkers. <laughs> you know, he was just like inviting people into his home and talking about all this really intimate stuff. But that's exactly the kind of love that Paul is asking for. Wacky, mad, over-the-top love. That's what Paul's asking for because Paul knows that God is sovereign over relationships. He's sovereign over the love between Christians. So he's sovereign over the practical stuff, over the relationships, and God is sovereign over the spiritual as well. So Paul prays in verse 13 that the church would be blameless and holy. Blameless and and holy. This is human beings he's talking about, blameless and holy. This is me and you he's talking about, blameless and holy. Who can be blameless and holy? 
You know, the disciples asked Jesus, who on earth can ever be saved? And Jesus said, with God, nothing is impossible. And Paul's absolutely right then to ask for this, to ask for the church to be made blameless and holy. Why do we pray? Because God is sovereign over the practical. He's sovereign over the relational. He's sovereign over the spiritual. So Paul says, I want to see my friends. Please, God, can you sort that, sort that out? Because he knows that God's sovereign over the practical. He says, Lord, I want the church to be more loving. Please, can you sort that out? Because he knows that God's sovereign over our relationships. And he says, God, I want the church to be more holy. Can you sort that out? Because he knows that God's sovereign over where we are spiritually. God is sovereign over everything. There is nothing we will ever bring to him which is outside of what he has power over. So how do we pray to this sovereign God? How do we pray to him? Paul prays to him, first of all, persistently. He prays to God persistently. Verse 10, he says, Night and day we pray most earnestly. Night and day. I don't think he means 24-7, but he must mean a lot. You know, night and day. Paul persists in prayer. He's always ready to talk to God. He's always got a line open to God. You know, sometimes my mobile phone will ring and I'll answer it and I'll expect to be talking to my sister or my brother-in-law, but instead, there'll be this little four-year-old voice on the end <laughs> that just says, Hello. That's all he says. That's my nephew or one of them. And he'll just say hello. And he doesn't hang up because he doesn't know how to do that yet. And so I get to hear, you know, everything that happens next, which is all, usually stuff to do with um, Bob the Builder and Buzz Lightyear and all of that. Persistent prayer is a bit like that. It's a bit like that. It's us as God's children, just dialing in and leaving the line open, not hanging up. Having that line open to always talk, to know that God is listening in. Persistent prayer. And one thing I found that helps me to pray more persistently as well is to begin everything and to end everything with prayer. To pray at the beginning of everything and at the end of everything. So every meal, begin every meal and end every meal with prayer. It doesn't have to be out loud, it can just be silent, but begin everything and end everything with prayer. So every phone call, begin it with prayer and end it with prayer. Every conversation, begin it with prayer, end it with prayer. Every email, pray before you write it, pray when you send it. Every TV program, pray before you watch it, pray afterwards. Lord, you know, help me to watch this safely, help me to glorify you afterwards, help me to reflect you when I'm taking in the message of this program. Praying at the beginning of a journey, at the end of a journey, Paul is persistent in prayer. He prays persistently. And he also prays ambitiously. He also prays ambitiously. If you've ever attended the 11 o'clock service, uh, and if you've ever attended the family worship, you'll know that our God is a great big God. <laughs> I've never done the actions on stage before. <laughs> and so our prayers can be great big prayers. Our prayers can be great big prayers. Paul, you know, he wants to go and see his friends in the church at Thessalonica. And he doesn't just pray, you know, I hope we have a nice time when I get there. He doesn't just pray, you know, I hope we get time to chill out together. Oh no, verse 10, he prays that he'll supply what's lacking in their faith when he gets there. So if there are any gaps at all in their faith, he's praying that he'll be able to fill them. If there's anything they don't know about Jesus, he'll be able to tell them. If there's anything they've got wrong about their relationship with God, he'll be able to put it right. That's what he's praying. That's what he's praying. That's an ambitious prayer. Verse 12. Paul knows that these guys are a loving church. You know, he tells them later on in the letter, he says, I've got, you know, I've got nothing to write to you guys about love. 
you know how to love each other, but does he say, does he pray, you know, just keep loving each other, just carry on doing what you're doing? Oh, no, 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 no. Paul prays an ambitious prayer. He says that he wants even more love. He wants love to increase. He wants their love to overflow. He wants there to be so much love in the church that they won't know what to do with it and they'll have to start loving people outside the church just so they've got somewhere to park all the extra love. Paul prays persistently. He prays ambitiously. And he prays expectantly. He prays expectantly. Paul's praying for the Christians in Thessalonica. He's praying that God will um, make their faith perfect. He's praying that they'll be more loving. He's praying that their hearts will be strong, verse 13, so that they'll keep on going, keep persevering until Jesus comes back. He's basically praying for the whole of the life of that church, now and in the future. The whole of the life of that church. And Paul is praying like he's expecting to make a difference. You know, he's not just praying like he thinks, oh, well, God's got that all in hand, so I don't need to do very much. He's praying like he's got a role to play in everything that's going on for them. He's praying like if he doesn't pray, then this stuff might not happen. And that's expectant prayer. That's expectant prayer. When we know, when we really believe that if the church doesn't pray, this stuff might not happen. That's expectant prayer. To pray expectantly is to pray like we are playing our part in the running of the universe. Is to pray like we are playing the part that God has given us in the running of the cosmos. John Calvin, the great theologian and pastor said, the whole world is a theater of God's glory. And in that theater, the church is the orchestra. The church is the orchestra. We're playing our part in the running of the universe. We pray persistently, we pray ambitiously, we pray expectantly. And what happens when we pray? Well, Paul tells us a bunch of stuff that happens when we pray. A bunch of stuff that we can expect to happen when we pray. First of all, people get saved when we pray. People get saved when we pray. Verse 13, he says, when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. That's not if, it's when. Jesus is coming back. He's going to have millions of holy, rescued people with him. And Paul's prayer is that his friends in the church in Thessalonica will stay holy so that they can be part of that party when Jesus comes back with millions and millions of saved people. It doesn't get bigger than that. You know, Paul is praying. He's expecting that people will get saved when he prays. Charles Hatton Spurgeon The pastor, 19th century, said, I have no confidence at all in polished speech or brilliant literary effort to bring about a revival. But I have all the confidence in the world in the poor saint who would weep her eyes out in prayer because people are living in sin. Be encouraged if you're praying for people to know and love Jesus. You know, I often pray that people would get rescued across Tower Hamlets, across East London. Our Connect group recently had a day of prayer and fasting that God would use us to rescue people in Tower Hamlets. And people in Tower Hamlets and East London are getting saved. They are getting rescued. And we want to see more of that. So we're going to keep on praying, expecting that people will get saved when we pray. When we pray, people get saved. And when we pray... The church gets more loving. The church gets more loving. Verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Just as ours does for you. 
So Paul is saying, I want your love to increase and overflow because that's happened to me already. You know? That's what Paul's saying. He's saying that his love button has been switched on to max for the church in Thessalonica. Whenever you pray for someone, God will change your heart towards them. Whenever you pray for someone, God will change your heart towards them. And he might change their heart too. Paul says it happened to him and he wants the same increase of love for his friends. So if you're here this evening and there are people that, you know, that you're finding difficult to get on with or you've fallen out with or things just aren't going well with, let me encourage you to pray for them. Pray for them. God will change your heart and he might change theirs. And I can only speak from my own experience. God has never, never, never let me down on this prayer, ever. Whenever I've prayed, Lord, let me love them more and let them love me more. Let there be more love between us. God has always delivered. He's always done something amazing there. Always. Always. So when we pray, People get saved, the church gets more loving. And thirdly, when we pray, we get joy, joy in the presence of God. Verse 9, Paul writes, how can we thank God enough for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? How can we possibly repay God in thanks for all the joy we have in the presence of God. When we pray, we must ask for and expect an experience of joy in the presence of God. When we pray, we must ask for and expect a real experience of joy in the presence of God. This is life-changing joy, faith-affirming joy. Joy in the presence of God. When we talk about prayer, It's always easy to find helpful lists of things to do that can help us, that are really helpful. It's always easy to find lots of different ways that we can pray that are really helpful. It's always easy to find lots of compelling reasons in Scripture that can motivate us to pray, to pray more, to pray better. But when we talk about this experience of God, this joy in the presence of God, we can't make that joy happen. I can't make it happen. You can't make it happen. We can't hype ourselves up to make joy happen. It's a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's not a gift that we get all the time. That's why it's a gift. God gives it when he gives it because he's gracious and he gives it or he doesn't and he's still gracious. And this gift of joy in the presence of God is as if God like creates wells of joy for us to draw on in the dry times. And so we shouldn't get disappointed if we don't get it because the fact that we might want it, the fact that we might miss it, The fact that we might even be asking God for it is only possible because the Holy Spirit is powerful and active in your life already. The fact that you're missing this experience or would like this experience or want the experience of joy in the presence of God is only possible because Jesus is standing right next to you. When we pray, we get joy in the presence of God. George Whitfield, an amazing Church of England minister, after a time of prayer one day, he wrote in his journal, Oh, what joy, joy unspeakable, 
joy full and big, with glory was my soul filled. Oh, what joy. Joy unspeakable, joy full and big. With glory was my soul filled. And that night he went to bed and he couldn't sleep because of all of the joy that his heart was full of. And he was just asking God, please stop, stop. I can't cope with any more joy. Teresa of Avila, the 16th century Spanish nun, she had some time of prayer one day and she wrote afterwards, my soul desired to cry out and was beside itself. It could not bear so much joy. It could not bear so much joy. Joy in the presence of God. And Paul, in this letter, in this letter to the Christians in Thessalonica, he says, how can we thank God enough in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God. When we pray, we get joy in the presence of God. So we pray because God's sovereign. We pray persistently. We pray ambitiously. We pray expectantly. And when we pray, people get saved. The church gets more loving. And we get joy in the presence of God. Shall we stand together?